Welcome to this installment of the Harker Speaker Series. My name is Catherine Snyder. I'm, I work in the Office of Communication at Harker. And I uh, just want to tell you a little bit about this wonderful series. Since 2007, the Harker community has enjoyed listening to experts and visionaries in a variety of fields in this lovely venue. And we're so glad that you've joined us tonight uh, for this unique journey into one of America's most interesting subcultures, ably guided by cultural historian Dennis McNally. And uh, usually our Harker Speaker Series has been founded slash aided slash held up by uh, the Journey family, John, Helena, Journey, and their daughter, Chrissy, and their son, John Nicholas, who are a very long time Harker family. So they're usually here, but I do want to give a little shout out to Chrissy, who's here. She graduated in uh, 2013, and she's kind of representing the family tonight. So thanks, Chrissy, to you and your family for all that you guys have done for the speaker series. We so appreciate it. So. <laughs> Let me just give you a few of those little fine print logistical details. Mr. McNally will speak for about an hour. He'll take some questions from you um, at the conclusion of his talk, so you can be thinking ahead about that. And um, should you need restrooms that are located outside these doors and over to the right, uh, please do turn off your phone so your fellow audience members aren't distracted by either your photographs or your ringtones. And one of my favorite things about the speaker series is that it's become a tradition for us to have a Harker student introduce our speakers. And so uh, tonight I'd like to hand the podium over to Caitlin G. Katie's a senior, and she's a student in a rather unique course that we teach her at Harker. Yes, we have a course called Jack Kerouac and the Beat Generation. And Katie, <laughs> isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> And uh, Katie hopes to pursue creative writing and psychology and women's studies in college, but it's really her interest in the beats, in writing, and in journalism that make her especially qualified to introduce tonight's special guest. So to tell you more about Dennis McNally's influence on the students in that Kerouac class, and a little bit about Mr. McNally himself, here's Katie G. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Caitlin Katie G, and as she mentioned, I am a student in the Jack Kerouac and the Beat Generation Senior English course here at Harker. I have been a longtime fan of the Beat Generation. As Allen Ginsberg wrote, I refuse to give up my obsession, and I refuse to give up mine. I have always been fascinated by the 1950s beatnik literature, and I even interned at City Lights Publishing which, if you know about beat history, it's owned by Lawrence Ferlinghetti and published greats such as Allen Ginsberg. Allen Ginsberg. Sorry, I'm quite nervous. Um, in my junior year, I, after absolutely no consideration, just reckless obsession, I chose to take the Jack Kerouac and the Beat Generation course. Um, it was one of the best decisions I've made for my senior year. If you are a student considering taking this course, I highly recommend that you do. The Beat Generation class has truly been an experience. It wasn't just a series of lectures or the same discussions about the same metaphors over and over again. It was about the beats themselves and how they influenced us, how they left an impact on us how their nonconformist attitudes changed the literature as we see and read and hear it today. It has been a great joy to be in Mr. Shuttleworth's class, especially helpful in waking me up during first period. Um, I have really loved the experience I have been given. So about Mr. McNally, you should know that there is no Wikipedia page on him, I checked. It actually made my job quite a bit easier. Yes, Mr. McNally is an author of books such as On the Highway 61, A Long Strange Trip, and Desolate Angel, and he's a historian and music publicist, but without the ambiguously sourced bibliography that Wikipedia can provide, I have been given the gift of speaking to you about Mr. McNally, not his achievements or titles. I don't know Mr. McNally very well personally. I have talked to him for about two hours and I am incredibly fascinated right now. But I can say with all of my heart that he is a creative thinker. As a writer and a reader, I have never read a creative nonfiction biography so vivid and well-researched. Whether it was the color of Jack Kerouac's mom's robe, which is brown by the way, or intricate weaving of hundreds of interviews quotes, Mr. McNally left me speechless. He pushes the boundaries on what it means to be a biographer. 
And he has pushed boundaries on what it means to be a biographer since the very beginning. His current and past works have specialized in the subcultures of America, the countercultures, the iconoclasts, the weirdos, and the mavericks. So no longer shall I bore you with endless flattery for this man. I present to you Mr. Dennis McNally, a maverick in his own right. My father was a minister, and he used to say of the podium where he would preach that it was like being six feet above contradiction. <laughs> um, so I tend to want to sit down and be at least a little, a little bit less an authority figure. Um, one of the fixed rules of reading history um, is that to a considerable extent um, you learn more about the time the book was written than you necessarily do about its subject. Um, just now, just as a side example, um, it is becoming, I hope, clear to most Americans um, that if someone says, oh no, um, the Civil War wasn't caused by slavery, it was caused by states' rights, um, well, either, e either they've been reading books written before, say, the 1970s, or they're just mentally living in the turn of the century, but the last century, not 10 years, 15 years ago. Um, but I mean, that, that's just an example. Um, and so I'm going to, I don't know entirely what uh, my, you know, reading my books says about my times, per, per se. Um, but I will, I will tell you how it came to be, and, and you, know, you can sort of draw your own conclusions. I graduated uh, from college in 1971, <clears throat> and I went to a small school in extreme, and I do mean extreme, upstate New York. Um, the nearest city was Ottawa, Ontario. Okay. My, my wife went to Cornell, and she talks about upstate and downstate, and I laugh a lot, because Cornell's practically in Manhattan when you're sitting up in Canton, New York, and, and it's 40 below. Uh, which is to say that the significance of that is really is simply that um, I witnessed, I had seen the 60s kind of at a distance. Um, and, you know, I smoked the requisite amount of dope and listened to the requisite records and, and uh, uh, went to occasional rock concerts, although again, weren't a whole lot of those in Canton, New York, um, and, um, and was fascinated by it all. Um, but at some remove. Um, so that when I got to graduate school, and I, I made a major discovery in graduate school, which was that, that being in graduate school, at least in history, um, in many ways closely resembled being a trainee at McDonald's, um, which is to say you were being trained. Uh, it, I had sort of imagined graduate school as, you know, people sitting around and discussing important issues and, and important historical stuff. Um, there was some of that, but there was also a whole lot of learn this, regurgitate that, and so forth. Being, uh, as Katie said, uh, a bit of a maverick, at least on that level, um, I, I didn't take too kindly to that. So I, I decided to try and take, turn graduate school on its head. And um, ordinarily in graduate school, you, you, you uh, soak up information for umpteen years, you pass your qualifying exams, and then you're told by your doctoral dissertation advisor what your dissertation is going to be about. Astonishingly, it will provide information for one chapter in his next book. Um, the trade being supposedly that you'll get a job out of that, which I don't even think that, I think that deal exists anymore anyway. But beside all that, um, I wasn't having any. And so in, in my first year, I said, you know, I'm going to seize control. And I actually, 
I said that and it actually did. It was remarkable. And the way I was going to seize control was to pick a dissertation topic first. And therefore, all these remaining years, and there was, I was going to be taking classes for another three or four years, um, would have some relevance to one to topic. You know, presumably, they would hang off this mental skeleton. One night about three in the morning, and I say three in the morning because I was an insane graduate student, uh, which is sort of redundant, but uh, insane in the sense that I, I worked harder than I ever have in my life. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I just, I was completely devoted monk-like graduate student. And I, there was another guy who was also monk-like. Uh, he was also a deadhead and led me down various odd paths in my life, and I'll, I'll get to that later. But, um, but he worked just as hard as I did. So we worked like maniacs. And then about two in the morning, we'd stop um, and uh, indulge, shall we say, and talk for an hour, and then crash for about seven, and then get up and do it again. And this night, I said, um, maybe I'll do something on the beats, as the mo because you couldn't possibly do a doctoral dissertation about the sixth in 19, this is, 19, this is now January or February, I think January of 1972. The idea of doing something in the 60s was you know, too recent for any serious uh, doctorate, uh, graduate school to even fathom. Uh, it was going to be a long shot to do something about the 50s, um, which presumably was what Kerouac, was when Kerouac came to fame, of course. Um, but I didn't worry too much about that. And I, so I said, you know, the beats. And my friend said, well, you know, his letters are at Columbia, which was partly true. I ended up at 10 other university archives by the time I was done. And here's the punchline. And you can stay with my friends in the Bronx. Now, when you're a broke graduate student, that's also redundant, um, uh, and you are offered a free place to stay in, you know, on the New York City subway system, um, and then oddly enough, the year before, my parents had moved to within 10 miles of where Kerouac was from, Lowell, Massachusetts. So the universe sort of leaped up and said, and I went to the library and there was no biography of Jack Kerouac in existence in 1972. The first one was published the next year. And I'll skip ahead and say that I opened it up thinking, oh God, do I have to change my topic? Oh God, oh God, oh God. And after three pages I said, no, I can do better than this. And that sounds a little cheeky, but it's true. Uh, or maybe, I, I don't know about the me, the, you know, so much about me, but it, it was, let's just say it was not a great book. Um, and, and certainly my point of view, remember I'm coming to this from the Department of History, not, um, not literature. Um, and that's, that's important. Because what fascinated, what came to fascinate me about Kerouac, um, and I'm getting things way out of order here, but my mind happens to work that way. Um, is that he did something incredibly noble, suicidal, which is to say he had, had, he had achieved success. He published a book, and now more than ever, but even then, just to publish a book was no small achievement. And he got good reviews, and he had a future. And, but it was a novel. It was a novel novel. You know, it, it, it fictionalized the elements of his life, of course, but uh, and he decided it was entirely insufficient, it, that stylistically, that his approach had to do something much, much, much further out. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to that later. But. And for the next five years, six years, he wrote stuff that at the time, and to the best of his knowledge, would never be published, which is suicide. I mean... What kind of writer writes knowing that you'll never publish it, even though you think it's good? Uh, and in, then, through a lucky series of chances, as luck would have it, um, he did publish it. And I'll get to that. I'll get to that. But the fact is that, um, as a historian, I found that 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 moral decision by him. Um, that's why I wanted to write about him. 
that he did something so brave. Um, I had done just enough work to know, to know that how lazy I, I was. That there was not a chance in the world that I would uh, want or willingly um, enslave myself, shackle myself to the typewriter, et cetera, et cetera, knowing that it would never be published. I, I'm not that brave. So that fascinated me, and I began to work. Um, as I mentioned, that guy that turned me on that day was a deadhead. He later that year took me to my first Grateful Dead concert. I became a big deadhead eventually. Um, and again, I'll get into a little more detail later. Uh, decided that what I was really doing, what, what my ambition was in life, was to write a, uh, now I'm a this is slightly jokey, but, I, but it's true, a two-part history of the counterculture in America since World War II. Volume one would be the life of Jack Kerouac in the 50, 40s and 50s. Volume two would be about the Grateful Dead in the 60s and 70s. And because I'm slow and because things happen, um, I wrote the book on the Grateful Dead and you got the 80s and 90s for free. And eventually, after 30 years, that's what I did. And then I tacked on, more recently, a book that's the background to all of that. Um, and that's called, it, it is called On Highway 61. And it's about all the lead, the, the lead up to um, the Beats and the 60s. So, you know, welcome to my world. This is the, when I talk about Kerouac, it's the beginning of what I've spent my adult life thinking about. Um, and I, as I say, I'm a historian and not a literature person, so uh, I'm about to now stop and give you um, a, a 10 or 15 minute um, uh, history lecture. Um, and um, it's interesting because I, I was in, envisioning this as being only students. So seeing my peers in the front row, um, uh, if, I, if I start saying things like, uh, that, that refer to uh, events that are e certainly in our, in our memory, if not in our actual lifetime, um, you know, it's not you that I'm speaking to at that moment. It's, it's, it's the students. Because, a st you know, it, it occurs to me that it's quite significant that a student uh, here in this room was born very close to the year 2000, one way or the other. Um, and I'm going to start talking about stuff that happened 70 years before you were born. That's where I start. And I, and I thought, well, you know, when I was in high school, that would have been, start really dating myself, but um, I was born in 1949, so I, that, that would have been essentially the 1880s. Did I pay any attention to what was going on in the 18, you know, 80s when I was in high school? I don't think so. And I, mean, I was into, his, in, in, uh, into history. I had, uh, I had a wonderful uh, history teacher in high school that determined my life for me in that way. Uh, I was always going to be a historian. Um, so, um, I, I'm, I'm, so I'm saying, I'm going to be talking about ancient history to you all, and, but I want you to know um, that it is, it, there's a very famous line, and I'm going to botch it, I know, but I should have written it down. Um, uh, there's a very famous line from William Faulkner, which I, who I urge you to read in general, um, and specifically the line is, um, the, past, the past isn't dead, it isn't even past yet. That's, that's not quite the, the accurate quote, and I apologize. Somebody can Google it. And, uh, feel free to interrupt me. Google it and interrupt me, and you can actually read the actual line. Because he, as you'd expect, he wrote, he wrote it much better than I said it. But the fact is that the history that I'm going to talk about has a great deal to do with your li life, however conscious you are of it now. Um, and that is this. Kerouac on the road comes out in 1957, causes a, uh, a stir. And it causes a stir because it's seen as challenging the status quo. Because the status quo, social life of America in 1957, was as fixed and as rigid and as, as um, boring um, as really any time in American history. Uh, there's always been a certain amount of flux. Uh, 
And there are, of course, reasons for that, good historical reasons for why it was so stratified and so repressive and so boring. And we go back, say, to, the 19, to 1929 and the stock market crash. Now, um, again, the students in this room were eight years old and might have vaguely you know, been aware, um, particularly if it hit your family particularly hard, of the, uh, the recession um, uh, in 2008, um, it would not have been possible not to be fully aware of the depression of the 1930s. Twenty-five percent of the people in the United States, of the working force, generally measured then as male, uh, were out of work. Uh, poverty was fairly well a universal and the economy was at a standstill. And that's the generation that Kerouac grew up in. My father, for instance, that generation, the generation that fought in World War II, so -called, the, the so-called greatest generation. So you have a start of absolute economic deprivation. And then, just for fun, you move into having to fight demonic fascism and Hitler and World War II, a war that's won by giant, uh, giant modes of organization in which the, you know, the government mobilizes everybody, everybody, you know, again, you know, we're fighting uh, two or three wars, like, it's hard to count how many wars we're fighting, except there's no draft, and unless you happen to know somebody in the military, it doesn't really touch your life. Everybody Everybody, first the draft, but everybody was touched by World War, that lived was touched by World War II. It was a complete, and it changed many things, among other things. And if you haven't been there, I hardly recommend it. Going up to Richmond and the Rosie, Rosie the Riveter, which is having women work in the factories because the men were off shooting guns. So you have this giant change. And among other things, it reinstated all the corporations which were held in such bad light in the, during the Depression because they just dropped kicked the economy into the, into the toilet, um, of course, were uh, brought in to help win the war. Um, and, and they managed to uh, keep their gains when the war ended. In part, one of the things that happened was that the right wing, the, the, the conservative side of America, at this stage in American history, uh, when you talk about right wing, we're talking about people so extreme that <laughs> I'm going to talk about Joe McCarthy, and it doesn't, it doesn't compare to some of the things that are said now. Uh, one of the, to people, there's been a lot of historical nonsense about, about the origins of McCarthyism, and people talk about it as because he was Roman Catholic as this, this sort of Irish um, working class sort of uh, uh, attitude about, about uh, the Eastern liberals. No. What happened, uh, in what or the origins of McCarthyism, which was this witch hunt that took place in the early 50s and basically uh, suspected anyone who uh, had sort of been too, too liberal or too liberal too early, um, and accused them of being un-American uh, un and, and communists. Uh, and I would argue, and uh, you know, I would have to do a serious, to do a serious lecture, it, it would take me half an hour and you don't want to hear it, um, but I would just argue in, in some that basically what was going on was that the people who had owned the country, which is to say the, the conservative corporate world, uh, which had run the country since the 1840s, um, which had been out of favor, at least at the, at the White House, um, during the, the, the Depression, um, took control again. And McCarthy was one of the, the symptoms. He wasn't really even the cause. So put those things together and a couple of others. And that is, we win the war, and all those people uh, who helped win the war, the soldiers, sailors, the, the, the military, were rewarded with the GI Bill, which gave them, A, a chance to go to college, which 
an entire social class and generation never would have imagined, my father as an example, um, with working class people, and suddenly they could go to college. And they could borrow money and get a mortgage. And that, you know, the, the American dream. And thus creating suburbia. All of that adds up to America in the middle 50s. Prosperous, but very, 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 you had to be careful. And the way I, I and again, I'm speaking to students uh, at this moment, the, 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 uh, the, the, the conformity you can see if you go on television and look for a, a classic, any one of a number of classic 50s sitcoms, my favorite example of this is Father Knows Best, not least for the silliness of the, of the title, um, in which everybody's white, everybody's happy, there are no real problems. Now, granted, comedies are, you know, it's not the comedy's job to explore the underside of American life. But what is different is people pretty much believed that that was reality. There was a very strong inclination to at least want to believe, you know, repressing all doubts. That, you know, mom lived in designer aprons and, and you know, cooked three meals a day. Dad went off to work, was wise, and, 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 you know, all the problems got worked out by the end of the half an hour. There was no alcoholism. There, was, there were no class. Everybody was middle class. Everybody owned a home. You know, it was the American dream. And as I say, there was this thread that suggested, well, that's, that's the way things are, isn't it? There's only two things that are getting any kind of significant coverage. Well, only one thing that's getting any coverage. Um, discounting things like the Cold War that's going on, you know, which is just the ongoing version of, of World War II, um, this time with the Russians as the bad guys and the Chinese, although I don't know how much people paid attention in the 50s much to the Chinese um, in America. Uh, but the only thing that disturbs the, you know, the, the father knows best world is what was commonly referred to as the curse of juvenile delinquency. Okay. This is going to get relevant to Kerouac, and I'll, I'll make this clear. Uh, the other thing that's disturbing the social order, but again, it's not really getting all that much coverage, and people are not paying all that much attention to it in the great, the, the overculture, the dominant culture, which is to say the white culture, is uh, the beginnings of the civil rights movement. Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, and Rosa Parks, who refused to get up and move to the back of the bus. I'm, I've always been proud of this. On my birthday, for what significance that is, on December 1st, on, but on Dece it always made me happy. On December 1st, 1955, she refused to get up. Um, I might add, it wasn't random and it wasn't an accident. She was a trained, trained civil rights activist uh, who had worked at a, uh, at a um, civil rights-oriented college that's just gone out of my head. Can't remember it. Um, and eventually, of course, uh, the local brand new minister in town, Reverend Martin Luther King, um, uh, led a bo boycott of the bus system um, for, I don't know, something like th six months, I believe. No black person in Montgomery rode a bus for six, with any respect, self respect, rode a bus for six months, and they won. And it was the beginning of, of the, truly the beginning of the civil rights movement, or one of the beginnings. Let's not leave out their predecessors. But the fact is, it was important. But again, this is really important for the future. But in terms of the, the general awareness, um, I would argue that in 1957, the only thing that that's people read about that really disturbs them, that's within America, is about is juvenile delinquency. There's, there's something going on wrong. That, that these kids um, kids aren't you know 
you're, you're casting for a Bye Bye Birdie, and, and I was just thinking of um, Paul Lind about, you know, why, why can't, can't ki kids be as per perfect as we were? Perfect, perfect in every way. The song's going through my head, but anyway. Um, and that's, that represents, to some extent, what happened, what was going on when Jack Kerouac published his second book. There's a great story to it, the, the actual publication, and that is this. It came out in September of 1957, uh, and in the normal course of things, a man named Orville Prescott, who was the primary um, uh, book reviewer for the New York Times, would have reviewed it. Now, Orville's nickname was Prissy, so you can imagine what he would have done with On the Road. But Orville, Orville was on vacation, and a man named Gilbert Milstein, who was um, a substitute and uh, later was the news editor uh, for uh, ABC News, um, uh, Gilbert Milstein got the assignment, and Gilbert was interested in this beat thing. He'd actually sort of vague, there had been some articles about it in the earlier 50s, and he was aware of it. And so he read the book, and he proclaimed it as a generational document uh, along the lines of, of um, The Sun Also Rises, and, and you know, just uh, canonized it, on, uh, and sales took off and never stopped. Um, and I, uh, you know, it's one of those critical moments. If he'd gotten a bad review, I don't think we would be having the Jack Kerouac class. I probably wouldn't be sitting here. I'll also tell you a side story, just because I, 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 lo I love this fact. I found Gilbert Milstein, and I've got this story, which I think is quite a great story, um, if only about the randomness of life. Um, but I found Gilbert Milstein because I was watching the news one night, and you know they rolled the credits, and there it said Gilbert Milstein, and I sort of went, you know, what are the odds? I mean, here's a guy who's writing for the New York Times, and there's a, it's got to be the same one. So I, you know, this is research, right? I picked up the phone and I called, uh, I think it was ABC News, but whatever, and asked for Gilbert Milstein, and you know, since he wasn't the star of the show, they eventually I got to him. I said, Are you that guy? Yes, I am. I got to talk to you, sure, come on down. And we ended up sitting in whoever the, his star, I, th I don't think it was Walter Cronkite, so it wasn't CBS, whoever, their office, and I did this interview with him. Uh, but I found, you know, I don't know how else I would have found him. Or, uh, there was no internet, guys, you know? You, you just, there's a lot more, ran research was somewhat more random at the time. No Facebook, would have been so much easier now. So. It begins a, you know, with that review, On the Road begins the introduction of beat culture to mass America. And when I say beat, Kerouac used beat, uh, a phrase he got from a, a, a real hipster, a guy named Herbert Hunky, who was a, otherwise known as Hunky the Junkie, because he was. He was a hustler, he lived on Times Square, and he was interviewed um, it, when uh, Kinsey did his interviews of sexual deviance. Uh, Hunky was one of the people he interviewed. Um, he, he was a, a legend. He, he was a legend, um, and um, Hunky would refer to you know the slang as "I'm beat, I'm tired," and beat became "I'm tired of of the BS of life. I'm tired of of conventionality. I'm I'm tired of." of conformity. I'm tired of, you know, listening to the man. Kerouac being Kerouac, he also would, when, when he became famous and asked about his use uh, of the phrase, um, he would um, say, well, it also means beatific. And it is fundamentally true that what Kerouac was trying to get at in On the Road, in a way that almost no conventional American could see, because it's, it's about young guys running around, doing crazy things, and listening to a lot of jazz, and having a lot of sex. And he saw that, and I would argue that it was demand, a demand for a spiritual regeneration of what had become a very boring, 
uh, and, and conformist and utterly consumer uh, addicted country. And he stood up and said, well, you know, there's more to life than that. And, he, and that was enough to set up, a, a, among other things, a cry of public protest. The critics were merciless, as they so frequently are, because he was such an easy target. Um, a, because he was not equipped to be a public spokesperson in any way, and so anytime he went on television to promote his books and stuff, um, he would get drunk, which is not the best way to make a public image. Uh, and he, you know, so in that sense, he was, uh, you know, he was not facile. He was not easy. He was certainly not smooth. Uh, but going back to what I said earlier about juvenile delinquency, what he was talking about was a, a more natural way of relating to each other in resisting that conformity. And the critics twisted that into violence, that the kind of, you know, the call of the blood nonsense of the Nazis, um, which is, you know, downright criminal. I mean, Kerouac was personally nonviolent and, and in general, there's no violence in his book. Uh, so to, to associate it with violence is, is, is it's malicious. It's, it, it says, again, it says more about the critics than it does about Kerouac. But that was, again, the, the association was there because, well, the only other you know, deviants we have are like juvenile delinquents or you know, Marlon Brando motorcycle riders, um, which again is you know, not a, you know, the, the great line from that, which is, you know, what, are you, what are you rebelling against? What do you got? <laughs> well, you know, that was kind of true of, of what Kerouac was saying, except that Kerouac was also a guy who you know, lived with his mother when he wasn't on the road and, and uh, you know, was a really a very conventional on many levels, uh, French, Amer you know, Canadian, French Canadian American boy from Lowell, um, who also had a wider world vision, and that's what led him to write a million words. Um, and that, again, coming in the context of this incredibly boring conformist America, what happened was kids then, you know, late teens, say, all over America, read on the road and said, I'm hitting the road. I'm going to do something different with my life. Um, and the Beats and his friends, as they published in those days, because suddenly they were, there was interest, um, spread an influence that, among other things, led to what we know, know of as the 60s as recently as, uh, and I was telling somebody today, uh, just now, um, David Bowie became David Bowie, which is to say he diverted from the, the straight and narrow of being an English schoolboy because he read William, William Burroughs. Um, and th that'll divert anybody. Um, uh, Janis Joplin read On the Road in Port Arthur, Texas, and said, I'm out of here and headed to San Francisco uh, to be a folk singer and then crashed and burned and went back to Port Arthur. And then fortunately, um, a friend of hers came back and said, no, you have to sing in a rock and roll band. Come with me. And she came to San Francisco again. Jerry Garcia had the advantage of being able to take the bus from his home in, in uh, the uh, outer mission district of San Francisco to North Beach, where he was an art student. Um, and his teacher uh, was a man named Wally Hedrick. Um, this is going to get a little complicated, but follow me here because it's, it's truly fascinating. Wally Hedrick was a beat, um, was certainly a, a, a bohemian artist um, who uh, worked with a man named Robert Duncan, who was a, a poet, a very well-known poet in San Francisco, sort of one generation before the beats. Um, and they opened up a, um, a little gallery on Fillmore Street uh, first calling it uh, the uh, Ubu Gallery, King Ubu? I think it was King Ubu Gallery. Uh, and eventually calling it the Sixth Gallery. 
Um, Wally, someone said, let's have a poetry reading here. And Wally said, okay, but I'm too busy. And he asked a guy named Michael McClure to organize it. And Michael said, I'm too busy, but there's this new guy in town named Allen Ginsberg. I'll ask him. Well, Allen Ginsberg had been a labor organizer and had, you know, was always the poet uh, with the biggest role, what we would, what we would once call Rolodex address book. I don't even know. Most students here have never seen a Rolodex. Um, but at any rate, he knew everybody and had everybody's phone number, and he swiftly organized a poetry reading. Uh, it was called Six Poets at the Six Gallery. It took place on October 9th, 7th, 1955, at the Sixth Gallery, on f the corner of Fillmore and Chestnut. Uh, no, Fillmore and da just down from Union. And um, the highlight of the evening, of course, was that he wrote, he read, he had recently come to terms, to considerable extent, uh, with the fact that he was gay, uh, which had been in, the, in good 50s repressed fashion, a, a, a subject of a great deal of torment for him all his life. Um, and as part of sort of res that resolution, he found his poetic voice. And he had written a poem called Howl, which changed American poetry for, certainly for our lifetimes. He was a, a friend of Kerouac's going back to, the, uh, to Columbia, where both, both had been students, actually at different times. Uh, Kerouac had dropped out before Alan got there. Alan was a couple years younger. But they, and a guy named Lucian Carr and William Burroughs, all hung out around Columbia in, during the war and basically watched World War II change the planet and basically said, I'm not having any. Uh, they became beat. They became uh, dissatisfied with the conventional um, wisdom of American society. I like that. So, I went, I, I skipped ahead, but it actually makes sense now. I do want to add, I've, I've overlooked one thing, and, I, I, and, and, and it's, uh, it's relevant. Um, as I say, the, 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 the critics' treatment of, of Kerouac and, and the Beats in general um, was, was uh, malicious, frequently malicious and overwhelmingly um, uh, hostile, and, and, and as I say, uh, frequently just downright you know, a fraud. Uh, the, the business about violence is nonsensical. Uh, what, what was interesting is that the, 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 the greater society, um, rather than, rather than uh, and, and, and the critics themselves, rather than take seriously the message, just as in the 60s, most straight people did not take seriously the, the message, however clumsily delivered, of the hippies. Uh, the, the, uh, the great example of all this is the most famous beatnik of them all. And by the way, they use the word beat. Herb Cain, this is all very local, very, the, the local angle. Herb Cain created, uh, in his genuinely witty way, the phrase beatnik because, as he put it, this was at the time of Sputnik. For those of, of you who don't remember, uh, in 1957, the Soviet Union put up the first satellite around the, around the world, around the planet, and it was called Sputnik. And Herb said, these beat guys and the Sputnik are both equally far out. <laughs> so they must be beatniks. Uh, he meant it as a zinger. Uh, it, it carries the, the, you know, the energy of being you know, so dismissive. And the most famous beatnik was a guy named Maynard G. Krebs. Okay, one of you knows who, the, who he is. A couple of you. Yeah, I suspect more than a couple, but not many. Google, it's, it's the universal information source. Uh, and then go and watch The Life and Loves of Dobie Gillis, which was another one of those sitcoms. And Maynard G. Krebs was a beatnik, and he was a character in this sitcom. And he said the word like all the time, and if the word work was mentioned around him, he'd go into palpitations. 
and he, he couldn't say the word. He'd like sw swallow it or something. It was, it was very funny. I loved him, uh, as a, watching him as a child. Uh, the point being that um, he was, he, in the, in this, in the uh, TV show, he was adored by, by children and, 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 um, and puppies. There was this, so he had a certain heart, which the writers actually picked up on, that connected to what Kerouac was saying in a goofy, off-the-wall way. Um, but of course, mostly, he simply appeared silly. He didn't wear a tie. He didn't, you know, he had a goatee. He had a beard. Don't trust those guys with beards. Um, and he, uh, I, I, I wandered. And now I'll finish another thought. So there you have Manergy Krebs, the perfect comic way of dealing with the message of the B generation, which is to say dismissing it and ignoring it entirely. I started to talk about um, Wally Hedrick. So Wally Hedrick is this beat artist, and he helps create the Sixth Gallery. And uh, one of the ways that Wally, I, I, I thought of him again with the word beard because Wally happened to have a beard. And Wally made his living at one point by being hired by Henri Lenoir, who owned the bar Vesuvio's, which is next door to City Lights, which everyone should stop in and have a drink just on general principles, um, as soon as you're legal. <laughs> and um, he was hired to sit in the, in the front window of, of Vesuvio's because the fact that he had a beard identified him as a beatnik. And so the tourists would know that this is a beatnik joint, and they would come in because they wanted to hang out with beatniks. That's sort of the strangeness of American culture at this point. I will go on to add that Wally Hedrick later taught at San Francisco Art Institute, and his best-known student was a man named Jerry Garcia, who went on to have his own tidy little career. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a small neighborhood. So, all of this connects, and I'm going to sort of wind up by going sideways, my style. And that is, these, these events of both the Kerouac and the Beats, and this resistance to the, the, the over- the, co the corporate America, which is basically what it boiled down to. And the second book that I wrote, which is about Garcia and the Grateful Dead, and the same thing, that they, they wanted to live their lives at some, some distance from corporate America, and managed until recently to do a fine job of, of succeeding at that. Um, but all of this is part of a much older pattern, which is my third. Sorry, my third book, which is called On Highway 61, which traces the connection of mostly young white people in America who paid attention to African American music, mostly music, African American culture, starting really all the way with Thoreau, who's a great deal of whose thought had to do with slavery, resistance to slavery. And then Mark Twain, who listened to the Fisk Jubilee Choir and creates later. Huckleberry Finn, Fisk, the Fisk Choir, was a group of former slaves who literally sang spirituals. This was the first time that black people performed in the North and, and that weren't in minstrel. They weren't in blackface. I mean, they, they dressed properly and, and, and uh, sang, from all accounts, beautifully. Uh, and that was one of the profound effects on him. I mean, he grew up as a pro-slavery Missourian. And he ends up writing Huckleberry Finn, which is an ongoing satire of the South and of slavery, uh, and in particular of, uh, the, uh, of Reconstruction, which was going on as he wrote it, and which was slavery part two, slavery redux, how, how the, the South re -won, you know, lost the war and then won the peace. Um, and on through, and I'm talking about Highway 61 now, the book, on through uh, from, from the late 19th century where you have this er eruption of black creativity and music forms, all the way to Bob Dylan, who takes 
one of the things that, that uh, this book sort of argues, um, people tend to think of, uh, of um, Dylan as this folky, you know, he sounded like Woody Guthrie and he played the guitar and he came to, came to New York City and he was supposed to be a, a folky. Well, what you learn as you get seriously into studying him is that his musical sources were at least as often black as white. In fact, he never paid much attention. He clearly, which is interesting for a guy you know, from the far backwoods of Minnesota, uh, but from all accounts, his, in his private life and his public life, he has always had quite as much to do with, with black music and black friends. He had a black wife at one point. Um, nobody stays white, married to Bob Dylan too long, but um, he, he, you know, had any number of experiences that had, you know, indicated no, inter no interest in a color line. Um, all of that derives from separating black music and white music by musicologists back at the turn of the century, um, which is a side lecture that I'll give you after if, you, uh, if you're really dying to hear it. But it involves a villain named Cecil Sharp, um, and that's, that's all I'll say. Uh, but the fact is that this relationship uh, to, to black music and by extension to freedom, to, to the pursuit of freedom, America has always waved the flag and proclaimed itself to be the land, of, you know, the, home, the land of the brave and the home of the free. And, you know, that we were supposed to be about uh, free, uh, freedom. It's fairly clear now, um, and without trying to start a big political argument, um, but maybe I will, uh, in the persona of the Koch brothers, uh, that there's kind of two kinds of freedom in America. Um, in fact, this goes back to the, the beginning of the, the Bank of America, uh, the, first, uh, the first Bank of America in the 1805, I think it was. And that is, there's the freedom to make as much money as you possibly can. That's been one major streak of American history. And then there's the other kind, there's the Thoreau freedom, which is to not make any money at all, to see, to see how little money you can make um, and how interesting you can make your life in other ways and how you can be free of somebody else's notions of what you're supposed to think about religiously or sexually or et cetera. That's the second form of freedom. And that freedom, which is associated with black music, has been a a form that, again, that, that I traced in on Highway 61 and that has been going on for at least the last 200 years. Um, and mostly in pretty conscious resistance to that, you know, plan A, make all the money you can, don't worry about the consequences, and, and uh, you know, enjoy the fruits of your labor. Uh, what I have spent my adult life, in these, at least in these three books, doing is trying to trace um, first, as I say, the, 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 the most recent manifestation. When I, when I started so long ago, uh, in 1972, the most recent manifestation is as in, uh, or the second most, the, the Beats, and then the 60s, and then the, the deeper roots. Um, and I can only say, uh, going back to where I started, which was you know, how terribly far in the past some of the, any reasonable high school student, and, and frankly, I met lots of unreasonable ones who were incredibly intelligent, and, and I didn't have to explain any of this uh, today. And I'm, I'm sincere when I say I'm genuinely impressed with, with the students I, I, I got to meet earlier. But for the average, shall we say, adult, you know, your fairly average student who might not have bothered to think about any of this, um, there is a particularly in a, a time in which we are also obsessed with having the newest, you know, I have to have the newest iPhone, the newest, you know, whatever, the consumerism. Um, Thoreau would not be a happy man. Uh, but for the average high school student who says, well, what is it about something that took place 70 years ago, say, uh, or 50, you know, 60, 70 years ago, the, this Kerouac book, um, what's it got to do with my life? And I will just say this, everything that's happening now, this in, entire presidential election, the social issues at the root of this election, 
the issues of sexuality, of, of uh, economic disparity, all of them started, well, they started forever ago, but they really started in the 1960s. And Ronald Reagan ran against them, first as governor and then as president, and it hasn't stopped. So that's, you know, I would only say that if you want, and to go back to, oh God, I'm pull, pulling another blank, the very famous Harvard um, historian um, who said those who do not study uh, uh, history are condemned to, uh, to relive it, I think is what he said. Um, but again, you can Google that. Uh, the, the fact is that where, where we are now as, as a society um, is exactly what all of these three books and these, these three issues um, have, have, you know, have traced and have started and started, in particular in the 60s, which is just, uh, I'll close with one, one last quote. I had the great, great good fortune, about 20 years after I got out of college, of visiting my college, which, as I said, is a long, long way away. And it, it, it was just, um, remarkably lucky that I was able to stop by for a day. And um, I got to take all my favorite professors out to dinner. Um, and I said, and these are history, history professors, and I said, tell me something, you know, we, we, have, we, my generation, the baby boomer generation, we thought of ourselves as, you know, different in the 60s. Did, uh, you know, were we? You know, you, you, you taught for 40 years and you watched them come and you watched them go and, you know, so what's your take? And he looked at me and he said, you know, you were different. You were interesting. And that's all I said, but, you know, I took that as a grand compliment and that's what this is all about. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just, uh, you know, stick your hand. No, no, the herb, herb didn't. The, 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 it got shortened down to beat, actually, um, by John Clellan Holmes, oh, yes. who's a, a fine writer, and he wrote an article, something, something, the beat generation, in the early 50s, which Gilbert Milstein, the, the critic um, uh, who, who reviewed On the Road, you know, it was important to him. Um, so, beat just sort of trump, well, the shorter, see, the shorter, the shorter wins. But it, it, at any rate, it, it, uh, it trumped, um, it displaced Kerouac's original vision, just in terms of common currency. But you're absolutely right. And again, that one, well, that was Jack. He, he was always, obviously, he was always committed to a, a conscious spiritual thing, whether it was his, Native Roman Catholicism or um, the Buddhism that he sort of adopted. Yep, yep. It was it was a long haul, and it ate him alive, frankly. And that's why um, he had always been, you know, certainly uh, good at at uh, boozing. Um, but as I as I wrote, you know, after he became famous, a uh, he could afford whiskey instead of bad wine, which not a good substitute. 
um, and, um, and, and he could really afford it, which meant, you know, I mean, he was up to a quarter a day by the time he died. You're not gonna, just, that, doesn't, that is not a recipe for longevity. Somebody else? No, no. I think there's a you know I think there's a direct connection. I mean, there's a literal connection. You know, the the scene in in the Haight Ashbury. Um, people, I just saw an ad. I forgot what it was for today for the fiftieth anniversary of the Summer of Love, which will be twenty seventeen, and I and I am I. I wanted to grab them and say, no, 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 you don't understand, because I've said this several hundred times, um, and that is, um, the Summer of Love was not the summer of 1967. The Summer of Love was the summer of 1966, when 3,000 fairly mature, people in their 20s at least, not, not high school, you know, kids just sort of exploring, but people who established, who were working mostly in the music scene, uh, or the making art or playing or whatever, um, experimented with freedom and LSD, oh, by the way, um, and sex and everything else that they could get their hands on. And it functioned. It functioned as a, mo again, it's like 3,000 people tops. It was a small, low-key scene. And it flew beneath the radar of public, uh, you know, Awareness, pretty much. I mean, San Francisco had a reputation for tolerance, so, you know, eh. They ignored it. And what happened was, everyone enjoyed, those 3,000 people enjoyed their, their summer and their fall so much that they decided to celebrate, and they threw a party, and they called it the Bean. And 25,000 people showed up in Golden Gate Park. You can't hide 25,000 people. Suddenly, it was in Time Magazine. I'm, I, to this day, I remember reading, it was either Time or Life, looking at pictures of Jerry Garcia wearing the Uncle Sam top hat with the, the flag uh, painted on it, playing in Golden Gate Park. Who was st standing behind him? Gary Snyder, Michael McClure, and Allen Ginsberg, the elder poets. They were like Big Brother. And they were there to provide a blessing on, what, on this sort of transmission of a tradition. They're, they were very conscious about it. They, they, they were very, you know, they were proud papas, as, as it were. Um, and Garcia, for instance, saw himself not as a hippie, but as the babyest, the youngest beatnik. When he was 16, he was studying with, with Wally Hedrick. Wally was the guy who told him, you know, you ought to read this book on the road. It is my, my, one of my few regrets in life that I never got around to asking Jerry if he bought or stole it. I was pretty sure he shoplifted it. He had no money. I, there's no way he bought it. But anyway, um, but he marched down to City Lights and he got the book. And the reason that I became the Grateful Dead's biographer is because I had sent him the Kerouac book. And, because, and I think I did a good job, but I mean, he really loved the book because Kerouac meant that much to him. Kerouac was his role model, and what he called his ethical role model. That the ethics of Bohemia, that you, know, you put your energy into, into love, into art, and not into making money. Now, oddly enough, in some cases, you end up then making lots of money. But his attitude about that was as long as he spent it faster than he made it, it was okay. And he did. He died waiting for his next paycheck. So, yep. No, you, a, a lady person. Um, I, um, I was, it seems from what you're talking about that so much of what made the Beat Generation is what they lived through, like um, the Depression and World War II. So I was wondering, um, with 9/11 and the recession, if you think we might see another great generation. I hope so. Um, I, you know, that's a very reasonable question, except that I'm, I am so appalled at the depths 
um, of, of discourse in this country now, in this election. It, and again, not particularly to start a political fight, but obviously I'm talking about Donald Trump. Uh, well, and some of the other seven dwarves. Um, uh, but I think, he, I think he's happy. Um, but um, he's tall, but. Um, that I can't, I, it's very hard for me to, I don't want to be negative here, especially to, in front of, uh, of high school people who've got, you know, 40 or 50 years to live and I'm sitting here saying, this is all going to suck and, you know, and what we've done for you, I can only apologize for, which, frankly, I do. Um, I, my generation clearly um, lost grip, um, but, um, all I can say is we're, we're so close to the bottom in terms of a significant chunk of people, A, you know, believing in, in, in creationism, which disturbs me, um, denying climate change despite all the, you know, stunning amounts of evidence in, in our face. Um, I mean, I don't think anybody in Northern California can do that given the drought. You know, if, if, you, if you can't dig what's going on, then... Oh boy. But anyway, um, it just, it, it, it strikes me, it's just, it's, that's so extreme. It's, it's gotten so extreme. There was a basic, there was a consensus about some stuff for the first 30 or 40 years of my life. For instance, um, things like, you know, Social Security. Uh, and, and, and later Medicare, that, that there, there was a, basically, it was implied that the federal government had come in on the side of the individual, at least, you know, those most in need. That's not necessarily a, a, a consensus any longer. There's a, it's a minority, but there's a, a very loud minority, and a very wealthy minority that spends a lot of money and gets its mes message across, that's, dismissing all of that social contract, virtually all of it. Um, everybody's on, your, you know, you're all on your own. Um, and that shocks me, frankly. I mean, I thought that stuff was settled. I'm a Buddhist and I'm constantly, uh, constantly taught uh, that, uh, you know, everything changes and uh, there is no permanence and this will remind me if nothing else will. But as I say, uh, I thought some things, you know, we had a basic um, societal agreement about. And right now, that's, that's being so challenged that, that I, I just, I can't, I, I, the, the short answer is I can't predict the future. I mean, it, it, th that's going to have, that, that's going to have to be resolved in order for, for something really good to come. And I would like to think that will happen. Somebody way in the back. Hi. You just mentioned you're a Buddhist, and um, I'd love you to comment more on, on that. And particularly, there's a line in the Dharma Bums, you can't fall off a mountain. Um, so I don't know, if you could comment on mindfulness in the beast. That'd be lovely. Well, when I was ranting about you know, how important uh, the 60s, 50s and 60s um, were to, to now, um, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the other threads. Um, it was, of course, um, Kerouac, Kerouac's Buddhism was kind of a visual overlay on his nat natural Roman Catholicism. It was very sentimental. It wasn't at, at all Zen. I interviewed um, Phil Whelan, who was uh, a poet and a, and a Buddhist monk, um, and he, he uh, sort of dismissed Jack's Zen. Um, because it wasn't Zen. Um, but ironically, of course, the Dharma Bums is a very important part of um, in cult American cultural history of introducing Zen to a wider audience, um, and that's you know um, that's certainly part of the cultural lore. Um, the, the the genuine students of of uh, Buddhism in the beat scene were, of course, uh, Gary Snyder and Phil Whelan, um, who. Uh, picked up on it, you know, I mean, Gary studied Japanese and Chinese and lived in Japan for a long time and um, was, was quite serious, it is to this day quite serious about it. Um, in general, 
uh, what the Beats signified and, and, and espoused. And Alan later became a student of um, uh, a Tibetan uh, teacher uh, in uh, Boulder uh, at Naropa Institute. Um, and that was his practice for the last, oh, I don't know, 20 years of his life, 30 years of his life. Um, but in general, what the Beats were saying was simply that, like, this, and by this I mean, you know, America, Christian, you know, Protestant, Sunday morning for an hour, uh, that, that, that that's the idea, that that's the definition of religion. That was the American definition of religion. If you're a little exotic, you can be Roman Catholic, and if you, well, okay, we'll maybe admit that there's some Jewish people around, but it's about the limits um, of America, in particular in the 50s. And what the Beats mostly just said is, it's a wider world. There's just a lot more going on than that. Um, and that Asian, whoops, can't forget that. Um, uh, that and that, Buddhism in particular and other facets of Asian religions um, were this you know, vast resource that nobody had paid any attention to since Henry David Thoreau, um, really. Uh, there were trickles. The, the, there's a great book, um, if, you, if you care about uh, studying this, called um, When the Swans Came to the Lake by a guy named Rick Fields. And it's a history of Buddhism in America. Um, and it's... Um, uh, it's an, it's an interesting subject, and not least because every once in a while, particularly in the, in the early 20th century, there would be these, there were the two in particular, um, these Buddhist um, uh, Zen teachers from Japan who came to America and sort of set up shop as individuals, one in New York and one in Los Angeles. Um, and for whatever reason, it, you know, the, the, the spark did not burst into flame. Um, and then what happened was that in 1959, a man named uh, Shunryo Suzuki came to the United States, was sent to the United States by the Japanese Buddhist Association to be the minister to a group of uh, older Nisei people in J Japantown. Um, within two weeks of his arrival, and he did do that, and, and you know, married, as, a, as uh, my father would have said, uh, he, they wanted him to marry them and bury them. And that was you know, pretty much about it. Um, but he actually sat zazen, meditated, and um, uh, within weeks of his arrival, all those beatniks uh, were, uh, were knocking on his door saying, we hear you're a Zen teacher. And he said, well, you know, stop by at 5.30 uh, a.m. and, uh, and we'll, I'll, teach you, I'll, I'll teach you how to sit zazen and we'll go from there. And the result is San Francisco Zen Center, which is the mothership of Buddhism in America, and it's a significant it's a minority, of course, still, but it's a, a much bigger minority than it was <laughs> um, and, and a, a significant part. Um, you can't fall off a mountain is a great Zen line, but I wouldn't use it as advice on how to, climb, on how to uh, run around the mountains. Um, it, it was just, that's a writer being a writer but it's a great line. Yeah, um, I just, two, two, one point and then another thing, there's a question. I grew up in Palo Alto in the 70s, and so I went to a lot of dead things, and it was interesting what you said about Dylan, which also seemed to be true about Garcia, where he didn't really have a color line, uh, and his musical influences were both Jews and American folk rock. Absolutely. And all that stuff. But then growing up as a kid, knowing all that stuff, it was extremely white privileged kids who were into over and abundance. And it didn't really have that message that he wanted. And so there's a lot of irony in maybe idealism, but then what actually happened was not like that at all. Well, the, the most embarrassing single thing uh, about being a deadhead was looking around and seeing the three black deadheads, right. all of whom were my friends. Uh, I, I knew them all. It wasn't hard. I, and I, all I can say is, people have asked me that, and it was certainly not because there was any kind of you know, resistance to having... I think when the dead became generally popular, it was just at a time when uh, young black people were seeking self-definition in ways that did not include white culture. Um, 
and you know they just weren't having any of it. And by the time, you know, by the time things got roll and and, and, the, and that's probably still true, in in some ways. Um, but it's it's certainly embarrassing. Yeah, I got this. But then the second question I have is really, just, you know, the whole thing about the beat generation influencing uh, the dead ends and the hippies and all that stuff. There uh, was a good book by Isaac, uh, Isaacson written, and he traces a lot of uh, the things that happened then influencing the personal computer industry and uh, a reaction against corporate uh, computer technology. The homebrew computer. And the homebrew computer, and then Apple came out of that, and now Apple has been co-opted into a major corporation. And so I just wonder if um, there's a fourth book there which really traces, because as growing up as a kid in the computer industry, Stuff. Everybody who did computers in the 70s that I was around had long hair and were totally idealistic to, like, not like deadheads. They were actually living free intellectually. Yeah, and that's yeah. completely changed. And so I wonder, you know, it's just really ironic, though, that how these things just don't play themselves out into idealistic uh, growth. And it, it's like the, the thing. I don't know. The, the, um, the most creative thinkers in Haight-Ashbury were a group of people called the Diggers. Um, a guy named Peter Berg in particular, Peter Coyote, um, and Emmett Grogan, among others. They were the best known of them. And they had all been uh, part of the um, Mime Troupe, San Francisco Mime Troupe. So they, they were politically left, and they were um, uh, looking for ways to, um, to liberate people if, if, with political theater. And what Peter Berg said, was, which was so very, very true, was that the, con the one thing that American corporations, business, can't co-op, co-opt, is free. If it's free, they can't touch it. They're not interested. You know, you got, you may, you know, you, 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 you become a hippie and you put on some flowers and you put a string of beads around your neck and put on your bell bottoms. And Macy's starts selling bell bottoms. And et cetera, et cetera. I mean, as long as it's a product, as long as it's a thing, as long as it's, you know. Now, what they did was they started a free store and a free, free meals and free this and free that. The most interesting, in an artsy sort of way, uh, was what they called the free frame of reference, which was, it was a frame. And of course, if you put a frame around something, it's art, by definition, right? So people would stand in the free frame of reference and they would have conversations about free. It, you know, got washed away with, with everything. You know, the, the, the Grateful Dead started off as, as, uh, as close to you know, small c communism as you can imagine, uh, supported by capitalism, I might add. They worked, I mean, you know, they, they sold tickets. Um, Owsley financed them for a little while by selling acid, you know? This, this, this is the way of the world. Um, but as far as the, the, the evolution of the computer uh, world, it, it's just inevitable. It's a pro it is, among other things, a product. Um, and, you know, that's what American corporations are good at, products. We have time for one more question. Um, no, I, 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 I'm not sure. Have, have I gotten any from students? How about a couple, you know, fair is fair. So how about a couple students down here? Um, so you, you used the word uh, malicious when you refer to the media and the way they characterize the beats and members of the beat generation. Um, and continuing on the theme of like irony and unintended consequences, you only thought off on the fact that uh, Kerouac really, really sparked and really started a movement, a larger movement that quickly overtook him and he was, he was kind of unhappy with that and he was kind of, you know, because he wasn't really a kid, he was, he was very much a, a kind of a, a quasi-conservative he, he, well, he was always politically conservative. He, he just didn't really think much about politics. You know, it wasn't important to him. 
Um, he, he, he thought of America as the place to be free um, and, and, and really uh, loved that and tried to liberate language in his writing. Um, uh, but then what, ha what, what, happen what happened was, as someone I think you pointed out, there was a long time, he'd made a great breakthrough. He, you know, he, he, he does this honorable thing. He, 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 he publishes a book, decides it's too straight, goes out on the edge and writes book after book after book that's like unpublishable because it's just too wild. And then he gets famous. And then he can publish everything and slowly does. The problem is in that interval, whatever he, emotional reason, fame is a hard thing to deal with. I watched Jerry Garcia be worshipped and it, it didn't do him, a, and he was, he had a sense of humor about it, which of course is a good start. Um, and he, he, he understood it, and he, could, he coped with it as well as anybody, and it still killed him in the end. Kerouac didn't have any resources to cope, and so he coped with Johnny Walker, and that's inadvisable. And he drank himself to death. Um, and yes, it is, you know, it is ironic um, that following the logic that Kerouac followed as a writer, a lot of people in the decade, you know, decades after Kerouac um, did things that you know, Kerouac didn't approve of. The classic example of that is, um, is uh, Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters, uh, who were, among other things, were riding around in a magic bus driven by Neil Cassidy. This is in 1964. They come to New York to go to the World's Fair. Neil Cassidy goes out to Long Island where Jack is living and gets Jack and brings him back to a party they're having on, in New York City. And everybody is tripping. Jack's drunk and everybody else is tripping. Well, right away, <laughs> communication is somewhat difficult. People are on different planets, literally. But what happened there, which was, was that, that uh, they had a, an American flag as a, uh, as a couch cover. And that really bothered Jack, that that seemed inappropriate to him. And he folded it properly and sort of set it aside. Um, and that's, you know, it's ironic and, and it's the way it is. Um, yes, I, I mean, I agree with you. Uh, there, there's a, a great deal of parallel. The basic problem I had with, with, with punk was that it was consciously based on uh, aggressiveness and, and hostility, um, which A, I can only put up with for so long. I, you know, it's, I find it a little boring after a while, you know? Um, I completely sympathized with the idea of challenging what they were really after was, you know, giant arena, what, what we used to call arena rock, you know, mid 70s, you know, the Eagles, okay? Um, giant, you know, rock a spectacle. Um, and, you know, punk is like sitting in, in uh, you know, in, in divey little uh, clubs and, 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 sort of pursuing art that's consciously anti-virtuosic, you know, where people, you know, you just made art that was as crude and like, you know, like a bludgeon, you just whack you over the head with it. Um, and I can appreciate it intellectually, but my ears don't. So, you know, I found it difficult to go very far with it. A student, please. I, I, I can barely see out there. Either of you a student? Oh, well, okay. As a historian, do you believe that the 70s and later half of the 20th century will be remembered as an like, equal part of the American culture? The 70s? And latter part of the 20th century? 
I think mostly speaking as a member of the boomer generation, of which that was my 20s, um, it'll, I think, in the end be mostly, the, 20, the 70s and the 80s um, will be remembered as um, when we blew it, when, when having awakened and seen a vision of, uh, you know, of a better America instead of, um, instead of working for it, instead of pursuing it and pushing. Um, because what happened was, you know, the civil rights movement just sort of vanished uh, in terms of any energy behind it. Uh, any, any effort to, to, uh, to uh, you know, narrow, I mean, what we've seen ever since, in particular, spectacularly in the 80s, um, is the beginning of an era where, where the, the, the structure was such that, that uh, income disparity, you know, just widened. Until now it's at a gallop. Um, and, and uh, you know, I'm embarrassed. Um, and, and I wish to apologize for my entire generation. <laughs> Whatever good that'll do. Anyway, thank you very much.